Okay, there's one other fundamental about this God deeds relationship question that I haven't really covered in enough detail that I better say now. Um, because God is love and because He's truth, He loves the truth. I mean, that, you know, that should make sense. Truth isn't truth if it's not free. So he loves everything that's true. And of course it's up to him to decide what's true. Okay? And what he decides is he wants truth to be free. So he creates based on what would result in all truth being displayed. Potential. What if? could have been, never will happen. It ends up all being on display through the creation he makes. That's really important. The design that God comes up with of creation is designed to reflect, primarily to reflect Christ. Okay? And you have to ask, you know, who decided this design? Obviously, all three of them wanted it. You see in Genesis 1-1 that it's Christ who did the actual creating. Did he do it as a result of Father deciding? Or did he do it of his own design for Father? And I don't know the answer to that yet. I know that, you know, what's, what is it, Genesis 1-3, the one who says God saw that it was good, that's Father doing the talking there. You know, it's God the Son in Genesis 1-1, God the, the Spirit in Genesis 1-2, real obvious. And, you know, we got New Testament passages tying back to that and also Old Testament passages. That's how come we know which God it is. And then, I think it's Genesis 1-3 or 1-4 where it says, and God saw that it was good. That, the, the, the needless repetition of the word God, the noun, is what tips you off to Trinity from the very get-go. Hebrew doesn't do that. If it's talking about the same person in a succession, it uses pronouns, not nouns. It's like, in, even in English, we have that same expression. We, we wouldn't say, Steve did his math, then Steve did his other homework and then Steve mowed the lawn. We wouldn't say that in English. If Steve is the only object, the only the only subject of the sentence, we say Steve did his math, then his homework, then he did the lawn. We wouldn't repeat the word Steve. Okay, because it's the same person. But you would have to repeat the noun if the persons are different. Same rule in English as in Hebrew. That's why we know it's Trinity right off the bat. But I'm not clear enough on who did the design. I mean, Father's the chairman of the board, Son is the CEO, and, and um, Holy Spirit is the CIO. Okay? That's the roles. They've all, they're equal, but they choose their own roles. They have their own personalities. They choose their own roles and ways of expressing themselves. Um, so the deeper fundamental is, okay, this design of creation is designed to reflect truth. That begs the question of, well, what is going to be called truth? What is going to be truth? The answer is going to be free. So the creation reflects the nature of truth itself. Good, bad, indifferent, what if, could have been, would have been, all the potentials. Very modular because it's creation. And therefore finite. It has a beginning. It has a beginning. It has an ending. It has its own characteristics, its own freedoms as a result. And everything is modular. I don't know if you notice that. But a thing that's bad is never wholly bad. And a thing that's good is never good enough. And everything has a finiteness about it. It either has a finiteness at the beginning, 
because it has a beginning or it has a finiteness at the end. Now, on one level you can say, okay, that's, and this God does say this, that's perfection. Because everything, see, perfection is a wholeness. Everything is displayed. Good, bad, and indifferent. All the woulda bins are still woulda bins because to omniscience everything is still alive. Okay? All the never will be's are still alive. He knows, you know, if it, it never will be, but he knows what would happen if it weren't, were. Like God will never sin. He knows what the effects of sin would have been if he'd have ever sinned. It's just, it's just these are things that, that are all part of truth. Truth includes all of the things that don't occur. It is true that a thing is not something. It is a true that a thing does not exist. That's a truth too. Therefore, it's whole and complete, and that's what perfect is. And that's why creation is this spectrum of things and beings every single one of them different from the other and yet very much alike okay and they all express the variety which is to say the freedom of truth so you can determine God's philosophy as it were his nature his thinking from just looking around at life and indeed, a lot of people have done that, and that is the topic of Romans 1 and 2. That the unbeliever has no excuse because he can look up at the sky and see God. And that's true. You can be five years old, you look up at the sky, and almost the first thing that's going to hit your mind is who did this. You're going to become aware that there is a designer. All you have to do is look at the sky and you can see beauty and design and, and the first thing that hits your mind is that somebody did that. Okay? You're not gonna you're not gonna think it's there by chance. Because it's arranged. Everything has an order. Okay? And I'm sorry about the atheist, but you know what? Sometimes there's just no talking to them. I empathize with them, and then on other occasions, they're just hostile without warrant. Because they just, they're pissed off. And they just want to be nasty to everybody who believes in God. Okay, fine, that's their problem. But any normal person, from five years old, looks up at the sky and automatically is aware of somebody doing that. And the idea of God and the belief in God of some kind, which is usually the wrong idea, has been around forever. Okay? The, the universe, the, the whole structure of the universe, whether it was 5,000 years ago, or 10,000, or 4.5 billion, whatever, or now, it's still awesome. And it still begs questions because there's so many things in this world that don't make sense. But that's part of truth too. If truth is going to be free, it has to be free not to make sense. It has to be free to be bad. Pointlessly bad. A whole lot of stuff in life is pointlessly bad. It's just like, how can people be so stupid? It's just hard to imagine that a human being can be as stupid as we humans are. I'll, I'll never understand religion till the day I die. Who invented religion? Well, Satan did technically. But we humans sure have added a lot to it. Where did we get the idea that if you rub some beads, that's a holy thing to do? Where did we get the idea that if you wear layers of clothing and pointy hats and pointy shoes, that are really ugly, by the way, that that's somehow holy. Where does women's fashion come from? Who invented the corset? Why is that deemed to be important or beautiful or, or alluring in any way, shape, or form? Okay? I mean, 99% of what we invent is ridiculous, pointless. 
But that's all part of truth, too. If truth is free, it's got to be free to be stupid. You with me on this? Now, and here's the point of the audio. God determining what is true, truth's got, truth has got to be free. All creation is going to reflect that, therefore it's free to be stupid. Free to be bad, therefore free to die. Free to have its bad effects that go with the nature of the thing that's bad. There's this big gap between the thing's freedom and its own effects and God. We all know that. In fact, that's our big puzzle. Okay, but God who sees it is due, juridically speaking now, is due something for the hassle of seeing it. I mean, think about this. God has to watch you pee. He's omniscient. If you pee today, and you will, that same moment that you're peeing that you're going to forget about soon after, he's been seeing it for billions of years already. And he'll continue to see it forever. Well, what's going to pay him for that? I mean, it's not a sin to pee. It's still something that he shouldn't have to put up with. But it's part of truth be free. I mean, he invented pee. He didn't have to. Why did he invent pee? I ask him that all the time. It's my sort of, what do you want to call it, canary in the coal mine question to him. Why did you invent stuff that is just totally humiliating and not so much to me but to you. Why should you have to watch me pee? It's a stupid thing to have to do. It's not worth your time. And he's always answering, you know, that's why I'm making the audio. Um, the thing is that everything that exists which he determines what's going to exist or not has got a, as it were, a juridical baptized, that's a key word, juridical baptized value he puts on it. This is really important, it's the key to everything. Let's take the proverbial speck of dust on the freeway. What's a speck of dust? It's a nuisance to everybody. Okay? It gets in your car. gets on your windshield. I can't think of a single useful thing about dust. At all. It's just a nuisance. Dust is bits and pieces of particles that aggregate together to form a speck of dust. So here's a speck of dust on the freeway. God has been seeing that speck of dust even before it existed sitting on the freeway. That moment when it sits on the freeway will always be alive to God. And before it sat on the freeway it was somewhere else. And after it gets picked up by some tire rolling over it then it's going to go to another spot on the freeway or it'll stay stuck in the tire. He knows the whole lifespan of that speck of dust. And he sees each moment as if it were a million TVs of that speck of dust. What's going to pay him for that time? Because, I mean, if he doesn't, he, you know, he can elect that that speck of dust never exists. He could elect that he only, that it be banished from his omniscience, in which case it's obliterated. You know, it has to be in his omniscience in order to actually exist. But he could banish it from his omniscience if he wanted to. Otherwise, God isn't omnipotent. See, the theologians really do not have a clue about 
what they tell us about God. They don't think through what they tell us. When they say God's omnipotent and then turn around and say he can't sin, they prove they're not thinking straight. If he's omnipotent, he, he can sin. I'm sorry. If he's omnipotent, he can banish something from his omniscience. It's an act of will. Truth is an act of will. Everything about God is an act of will. You, know, you and I got arms and legs, and it's our will that moves them. Okay, all of God's other attributes are a product of his will. They are the objects of his will. They are the products of his will. He does what he wants with them. He, can, he does what he wants with his righteousness. But his righteousness is a product of his will. Love is obviously a product of will. But so is omniscience and omnipotence and veracity and internal life and everything else. Because if he didn't want those attributes, he could kill them. Otherwise, he's not omnipotent. In other words, God can stop being God or change what God means, Godness is, anytime he wants. He won't, but he can. Now, since he won't, but he can, then he has some kind of, how do you want to call it, a will about that speck of dust on the freeway and what it means to him. The speck of dust cannot create a meaning for God. A speck of dust is a speck of dust. It can't do anything but be a speck of dust of itself. But God can baptize that speck of dust with a meaning that pleases God. That's a hypostatic union. Beginning to get the drift of this? Technically speaking, the hypostatic union is the union of Godness and humanity in one person, one will, forever. It's not a union if it's more than one will. The stupid, you know, retarded Catholics were arguing over that. One God and two wills, or two persons, and the boy. They were all retarded on both sides. They didn't know how to argue the question. One person is one will. Personhood is one, will is one. Duh. You got two arms, and you're one person. He's got two natures, and he's one person. That's not hard to understand. Two natures is like two arms. Except it's two whole natures rather than just appendages. Alright? That same idea is applied to everything in life. That's how the cross works. Our sins were united to Christ on the cross, Isaiah 50, 3, 10, and 11, and 6, and 8. Well, 8 isn't really about the sin. 9, well, 9 isn't really about it either. It's, uh, it's, it's, well, who makes a lot of, 10, and 11 are about the uniting of sins to Christ on the cross. Now, by that same mechanism, which is the heart of everything, everything else is baptized with the meaning. There is a hypostasis, stasis, hypostasis, if I pronounce it better, hypostasis, in everything. So the speck of dust is baptized with a God meaning, a God deed in order to make it worthy of being witnessed by God, Father, Son, Spirit, forever. Now what could that meaning possibly be? Well, I don't know. I'm asking God that question all the time so I can better understand what I'm saying. Again, I want to emphasize this. I understand the answers. But that doesn't mean I can live with them well. I can articulate. But living with them is a, is a journey every day that I fail at. Okay? He's baptized a meaning on that speck of dust that pleases him. Therefore, the speck of dust is juridically allowed to exist. Now, speck of dust can't sin against God. We know that. 
you and I do sin against God. So there didn't have to be, directly speaking, a Christ to pay for the speck of dust itself. However, one of the uses of the speck of dust is to provide an environment for man. Man sins. So this is part of the cost of being human. So when Christ pays for sins, he's indirectly paying for the price of all creation, human or not. Because all this other stuff is part of the cost of our existence. You see that? I mean, if you know anything about business, that shouldn't be too hard to understand. You got, you got your marginal cost and you got your fixed cost. Marginal costs are the cost per unit of production that you make. Okay, fixed costs are the cost of all the other stuff that's required in order to get that product made and shipped and sold to the customer. Okay? There are fixed costs that don't vary with how many units you sell. There's overhead. That if you sold 10 units, it would be the same overhead as if you sold 20 units. And then there's a sort of gray area where if you sold 2,000 units, your overhead doesn't change, you know, will change a lot because it's 2,000 units versus 5,000 units. That, that would mean like you have to open up a new office in order to sell. Okay? So it's the same thing, it's the same thing here. You got fixed costs and you got marginal costs. You got direct costs that are directly associated with producing the object. And then you got indirect costs that are the things that support the production of the object but themselves don't produce the object. Okay, well human beings are human beings. That's the direct cost. Okay, but in order for a human being to exist, we have to have a place to live, we have to have clothing, we have to have transportation, we have to have land. Well, land is made up of dust. So the dust is an indirect cost of humanity. So when Christ pays for sins on the cross, he's paying for that speck of dust. So part of the baptized value onto that speck of dust, part of it, is Christ being on the cross. Because it's an indirect cost of human existence. There's more to it than that, but I haven't figured out the rest of it yet. Bottom line is, and that's why I'm using this as an example, the speck of dust is baptized with a value. All this is, you know, part of the decision to create. All this is at once in the design. The design that allows that speck of dust to exist has atop it a God deed that baptizes that speck of dust with a meaning to God that pleases him enough to warrant its existence. Get that straight. That pleases him enough to warrant its existence. A meaning to God that God assigns, baptizes that speck of dust with. This baptized meaning is not part of the nature of the speck of dust itself. It's a juridical baptism. Just like we were baptized in Christ. That was juridical. Okay? We weren't there on the cross with him. It's juridical. It's a juridical assignation of meaning, of value, that God the Father assigned to the thinking of Christ on the cross when he imputed Christ with our sins. That's juridical. Same thing with the speck of dust. God assigns a meaning to it that is solely God's decision, that is solely God's function, that is solely a God deed. Beginning to get the picture about how different God deeds are versus good deeds. Now the speck of dust is going to do what a speck of dust does of itself. 
But there's nothing about that speck of dust that can do anything for God. So God baptizes the speck of dust with something that makes it worth his while to see that speck of dust. That's solely from God's end. That's solely God's meaning. It's solely God's determination. And therefore, juridically, that speck of dust is justified to exist because God has assigned to it a value that makes it pleasing if it exists. You got that? Everything in life, whether a, a pencil, an email, a tire blowing on the freeway, someone getting cancer, someone getting a million dollars, every single moment in every single life and non-life even down to specks of dust has a baptized meaning on it to justify God seeing it forever and all of that meaning is tied in part and maybe at the foundational level probably to the cross because the cross has to underwrite all creation because everything is a direct or an indirect cost of soul existence. And I say soul existence here because angels have souls and I'm convinced that Christ paid for the sins of angels on the cross too. <coughs> and I have to do more work to prove that out but all sin has to be paid for on the cross. There's no other mechanism to pay for it. And God has to be paid for all sin. Otherwise, God is being cheated. That does not mean, and that's what I'm getting at here too, that does not mean that what God receives as, as payment has to be applied to anybody. If you do work for me, and I pay you, that doesn't obligate you in any way, shape, or form to spend the money I pay you on anything in particular. You spend it the way you want. Christ paying God did not obligate God to save us. Christ paying God did not obligate God to save everybody that was paid for. That's, that's a, a, a brain fart by the Calvinists. They think that if Christ paid for everybody, then everybody has to go to heaven. Oh, no. Then they're claiming that God is obligated to use the funds he got from Christ to save us. God isn't obligated to do anything. Christ wasn't obligated to pay. God isn't obligated to use that money to save anybody. Spiritual money. God can do whatever he wants with it. He chose... This is what's... A, crazy about the Calvinists. They're so big on sovereignty, but they don't get what sovereignty is. Christ sovereignly chose to pay. God the Father sovereignly chooses that, that, that he'll apply the payment to whoever believes in Christ. It's that simple. He didn't have to pick specific individuals in eternity past. He did foreknow who would believe, but that's not the way salvation was phrased. It's the, the phrase is whoever believes. Okay, well, he paid for everybody, so whoever believes. And sure, he knows who that is, but that's not the point. The point is, is that it was a sovereign decision that he would use that formula to save. You believe in my son, you're saved. I don't care who you are. He paid for everybody. Therefore, God is not cheated, and God is sovereignly using the funds from the cross to apply according to the formula he sovereignly set. It's not hard. The Calvinists are totally retarded. They don't understand God at all. But none of the denominations understand him. It's pathetic. So God sovereignly baptized the cross having this meaning that whosoever believes in my son is saved. That's his baptized meaning on Christ's payment. Like he could have sovereignly decided it have a different meaning. But that's the meaning he assigned. Because he felt like it. Right, wrong, or indifferent. We can argue about it all day long. 
that's what he did. So similarly, he's baptized every speck of dust, a computer, a printer, a piece of paper, a blanket. So he has to see all that too with meanings. So here's the punchline. Everything you do and think can be something that God has baptized as a meaning. But just like the cross is that payment, that value that he's assigned, is it going to apply to you or not? See, Christ paid for every human being ever born. But not every human being ever born believes in him. Therefore, the payment that Christ made isn't going to apply to every human being ever born. The theological term for this is particular redemption. You're not redeemed if you don't believe in Christ. Because God chose to have this have the meaning. And he also chose that, hey, do you believe in my son? Then you're saved. You don't believe? You're not saved. That's his rule. Okay, the same thing is true for every second you and I breathe. He has a rule about what he wants our that moment that we're living to, to have. There is a rule. There is a, a goal. There is a plan. There is a will. He has a will for everything and every moment too. So, is his will for this moment that I'm talking on the audio being achieved or not? Well, for him, he's found a way that it's achieved no matter what I do and think. But am I going to get a value out of it? If I'm using 1 John 1 9 and in between sins, you bet I will. If I'm learning and living on Bible, you bet I will. If I'm busy trying to do a good deed, you bet I won't. If I'm in a state of sin, you bet I won't. If I'm busy trying to be important or do something out of my own power, you bet I won't. See, because it's just as much a requirement that it be a God deed on that speck of dust as it is on me. What am I but a, a talking speck of dust? The difference between me and a speck of dust is I got volition and it doesn't. So I can choose. I can say, you know, Dad, I sinned. Now I'm filled with the Spirit. I'm talking. And He's doing to me His will. So His will for this moment, not, I'm sure not 100% because, you know, I'm, I'm still not fully made up yet. But more than zero. I'm getting because he's doing something to me every time I'm between sins he's doing to me what he wants and there's also a scope limit because of you know when you're a child when you're immature spiritually there's only there's a sort of corridor of what can justifiably be done to you the more we learn and live on Bible the more every moment counts and the more you grow out of every moment and the more God does to you so that's why you really want to try to avoid sin as much as possible. Live on 1 John 1 9. And learn and live on Bible as much as possible. And that's why I keep on saying, ask God about everything. What should I eat for dinner? What should I wear? Not because you're trying to be legalistic, but because you're trying to get the bi-directional. You want to hear his thoughts. You want to, you want to, you want to have the conversation. And you want to get as much of that God deed happening to you is possible and you'll keep on screwing up you'll never get it 100% right but if you don't ask you'll get 0% of it right and it's not even about getting it right it's about having the relationship I mean if you love somebody you, you want to know their opinion on everything just because you know, and, and you're always talking in terms of right wrong because that's where we have to live our lives. But a lot of the right wrong is it's right just because. It's 
okay to ask just because. God doesn't mind if you pepper him with questions. I mean, nobody minds if you're interested in their opinion. Alright, so what's God's opinion? And sometimes it's really funny. You know, like I said in the earlier, the earlier audio, sometimes what if his opinion was that you ought to buy a Porsche? You know, how are you going to know if that's his opinion if you don't have a long enough conversation so that you know why he thinks what he thinks? And you're certainly not going to know any of that if you don't know Bible. And every Bible, every Bible verse tells you something about him. So why wouldn't you ask? Okay? And I don't ask enough. I'm not, you know, this isn't, this isn't a religious thing. It's a relationship thing. Different are. Oh, Dad, what, you know, should I have the fish? Or should I have the chicken? And then there's a little analysis about, you know, advantages and disadvantages and prep time and what else I could do with my time and da 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 da. And all that sounds very legalistic, but what it's really doing is it's teaching me how to think. Because God's training all of us to be kings. Because Christ is king. And if you want to be Christ like, you have to become king like. And then you see him better. I mean, there's no particular joy in being a king. But there's a whole lot of joy in seeing Christ, and that's the way he is. So I got to become like a king, so it goes through all this thinking, you know. There's pros and cons of everything. But then I was trained that way, you know, it's in diplomacy, it's the same thing. Politics, diplomacy. There are 19,000 sides to the smallest question. Law, l lawyering is like this too. Everything has 16,225 ramifications. Even if you're choosing between chicken and fish. Alright? But it gets you trained in a thought pattern. And it gets faster and faster, like practicing piano. And you get more and more sophisticated. And, and actually it becomes very enjoyable. I mean, you know, it sounds complicated at first, but once you get in the habit of it, it's really fun. Because then you find out God's reasons for things. So it's it's a way to have a relationship with him, even though the ostensibly the topic is about whether you're eating chicken or fish. Or do I email this letter now, or do I wait, you know, a half an hour? Or, or can I go study this Greek thing now, because I'd really rather be studying than working? <clears throat> and, and, you know, a lot, for years the answer was study first, when it seemed like it should be work first. And now I want to study first, so now it's work first, because he's sh shifting me over. See, now that I'm totally addicted to the study thing, and all I want to do is study Bible 24-7, now i got to work. I have to do without. So this, this is like relaxation and dessert for me to be able to make this audio, because I have to work so much. Before, it was all Bible, and I wasn't allowed to work. And now it's all work, and I, I get to have this as dessert. So you see, this is the point of it. He's baptizing every moment of your life with a meaning. The question is, how much of that value are you going to get? Well, you ain't going to get none if you're busy trying to do good deeds. You're going to get a whole lot if you're busy trying to learn and live on Bible. Use 1 John 1 9, find out who your right pastor is, one male at a time. Find that pastor. God will show you who it is. Nobody else can show you but him. But he'll use human agents to expose you to the guy. So you find out. So ask God and then be alert. Then learn and live on Bible under that pastor. And watch what happens when you do those three things. I went four. Talk to God all the time. At least in your head. Don't do it out loud or people will think that you, you know belong in a mental institution or do it out loud when nobody can hear you those four keys will make you grow will bless the world more than all the good deeds you could ever do because basically what's happening is you're going through downtime all those good deeds you could have been doing but you're now just studying bible i can't tell you how many times i've heard people complain to me about that one woman stopped talking to me for two years because I would rather study Bible than do the things she thought I was good at. 
she thought I was wasting my time. Huh. Yeah, <laughs> I have no regrets. Okay, meanwhile, God is doing God deeds on you. And because of the downtime that you have to study Bible, well, you know what? Then the arm of God has to replace your useless sprained arm. And he's just going to have to, well, let's see, what's going to be good compensation? Because I'm making brain out study and doing audio, which is not a good deed because she's just doing what she likes to do, you know. Well, let's see, I'm going to have to reward the world with what? Let's see, good weather, we'll make some of the politicians competent, really big stuff because, you know, God has to see that too. I mean, if God's going to reward, he's got to reward at God's level, not at brain out's level. What good deed could I do with a sprained arm? Not much. God could have prevented me getting the sprained arm. If I didn't have the sprained arm, I couldn't make this audio. So apparently it's more important to do the audio, and I wouldn't be making the audio if I didn't have the sprained arm. I'd be working. But I have to stop and rest. So God's rewarding the world in a much bigger way. And everybody associated with me is getting what my pastor liked to call blessing by association. And he spent seven years of daily Bible classes explaining that during the very years that Edward P.F. 123 claimed he was there. And has no knowledge of that doctrine at all. So, seven years about blessing by association. Because why? Because I have a sprained arm and I have to sit here on this audio. And I can't do any good deeds. I've never done a good deed in my life. <clears throat> Hope I never do. So, for all this downtime, and your downtime in listening to the audio, and my downtime in studying Bible so I can make the audio, and all these indirect costs and marginal costs, and all these fixed costs of my existence, oh, well, you know, what's going to pay for that? Well, they're all dividends from the cross. Oh, but God can do something. Okay, well, so he's probably dumping a billion dollars, a trillion dollars worth of value on some somebody. Because with God, everything is big applied to small. A God deed is a baptized God value on a speck of dust. Even this speck of dust who's talking. See the difference? It's all about relationship, honey. And he baptizes everything. Isaiah 54, 1, 2 Corinthians 12, 9, and 10. With himself. In order to justify the existence of the low thing. So he baptizes high to low. That's the mechanism of the cross. In order to have a relationship with the low. So that low is no longer low. Of itself, always low. Of myself, I'm a putz. But what God's doing to me justifies my existence. Even to me. So I'm not low anymore, even though I'm low. That's how God thinks. That's why he designed creation this way. He wants full truth to be free, all the way down to the lowest speck of dust. And he baptizes everything with a God deed to justify its existence. And therefore, its existence is no longer low. Because he's baptized onto it, Godness. A God deed that pleases him. Hebrews 11, 6. So what pleases God? What God does? So the question we all want to be asking. What do you want to do to me here? What should I be thinking? What do I eat for supper? 
So I want this to be a God deed instead of a good deed, okay? And then he'll let you know. And you have to keep asking. It's like piano practice. And see, he's even made it simple. What am I doing now? What should I be thinking now? How do I write in this email? And he will cause you to know. And that creates the relationship. Because relationship is a conversation. Relationship is always a conversation. A two-way conversation. So you pray, baby. And prayer doesn't just mean, Oh God, I want this. Oh God, please can I have this? Oh God, I ask for this. In Jesus' name, amen. You don't talk to your friends that way, do you? So why do you talk to God that way? God is a person. Share everything with him. That's what David did. That's what the Lord did. That's what Paul did. Remember Abraham? He talked to God as God, you know. He even got mad at him. Okay, so you get mad at him. So you use 1 John 1 9 afterwards. It's a relationship. 24-7. And that's bringing every thought into captivity. So you see, it's an obedience to, but it doesn't play like that. It plays like intimacy. Because he baptized your life with his value. The question is, how much of that value are you going to get? Answer, use 1 John 1 9, find your right pastor. Learn and live on Bible under that pastor. Talk to God all the time. Because you want to know how he thinks. And that way you're learning and living on Bible. Because he thinks Bible. He will show you how the Bible applies to an email, to a speck of dust, to go into the bathroom, to buy in a Porsche. Full spectrum, baby. And then the world will get more God deeds out of you than all the gross domestic product of all the products produced for all time. Test this. Bye.